to introduce our next guest, Richard Hollis, who has already, already been introduced in a wonderful way this afternoon by Alice Rothorn in her talk. Um, Richard Hollis is a graphic designer. He's been a printer, an art editor, and a design historian. During the 1970s, Hollis worked for the Whitechapel Gallery, and he's also uh, done work for the Serpentine Gallery. We saw yesterday uh, Daniel Buren. Richard designed an amazing poster uh, and printed matter for this exhibition Daniel showed us yesterday here at the Serpentine. He's worked a lot with artists, um, Richard Riley, Michael Landy, Lucian Freud, Howard Hodgkin, to just mention a few. One of his most intense collaborations is with John Berger, who was here yesterday. Hollis designed three books for him, G, Ways of Seeing. Ali spoke beautifully this afternoon about the importance of ways of seeing, and also a fortunate man. There is another parallel reality, so says David Deutsch in Quantum Physics. The other parallel reality is Richard Hollis's work as a publisher. He produced memoirs of poets, among which two on Ted Hughes, and his own books include graphic design, a concise history, Swiss graphic design, the origins and growth of an international style from 1920 to 1965, a very important book for the protest against forgetting, remembering so many Swiss graphic designers of that period, and this year, very recently, his new book about graphic design. Today, Richard presents Notes on Memory, mainly visual. A very, very warm welcome to Richard Hollis. Good evening. Um, I've taken the topic of memory quite uh, literally, uh, and I am illustrating it with um, what maybe other images you've seen or, or people have talked about. Um, so I, I, I'd apologize for that repetition. And also um, for the autobiographical interventions, because I found that just in thinking about memory, it's impossible to avoid one's own memory, and, and uh, so that the, the words that uh, will recur uh, are, are things like um, memoir, memento, uh, monument, souvenir, and uh, of course the word remember, and of course forget. Um, and the captions I, I, I will be reading out are, are rather like the captions that you'd have in a, in a magazine, because I was once an art editor of a, of a weekly sociological magazine, and, and that may become only too apparent. Um, can I have a, a picture? Um, now, <laughs> yes, this is, it's obvious that they say that, um, uh, well, as you know, that elephants don't forget, but and the French um, Minister of Culture, a uh, man of action, or uh, the one time, man of action and minister of culture. Uh, we'll meet him later. He prefaced what he called his anti-memoirs with a statement about elephants. He said, the wisest of animals, the only species to remember their earlier life. They remain motionless for long periods, meditating on, on their past. Uh, later on, I'll ask whether this is true, because it plainly isn't. But the fact that he called his book anti-memoirs points to the unreliability of, of memory. And for example, uh, Clive James called his uh, autobiography Unreliable Memoirs. Where, and that those sorts of titles, and there's another one that we'll see, um, really relieve the, uh, the writer of, a, of a, any need for authentic recall. Now, photographs, I think, are the most uh, common triggers of memory. And as one of the first uh, pioneers of color photography was a writer called uh, Leonid Andreev, and this is uh, with his wife in about 1910. It's a, a keepsake a, 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 um, to keep a memory for the future, but I wonder whether it's like dreams, whether, you know, people ask, well, do you dream in, in black and white? Uh, this is unanswerable. But another couple, and uh, this is evidence on occasion, this is a photograph by... Um, Cartier-Bresson, who called uh, uh, one of his books The Decisive Moment. And here is a, a couple. But unlike the photograph before, you can see that this could never be kept as a memento to remember a moment. In fact, this is a couple who, after the division of Europe by the Iron Curtain, were separated. And so not only will they not see the photograph, but 
their only memory will be what they, they hold in, in their own memories, which they will recreate and transform. Now, this is uh, really page two. Because this is, uh, e uh, these events are, uh, are dedicated um, to Eric Hobsbawm, um, I thought we ought to show a photograph of an event which he decided to remember. And here he is, top right, in, 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 in Paris on Bastille Day in 1937. And for a graphic design, it's interesting that the, the um, it's a sort of, it's a photo, it's a lorry from which the filming is done. The symbol with the arrows is the emblem of the Social Democrats, not of the Communist Party, which, as, as we know, um, Hobsbawm was associated with. Um, now, I ought to say it now that for an art editor, and this is a, a spread that I did years ago uh, at a time, in fact, when John Berger was working for New Society magazine, where the person had written about dance. So uh, what I'll be showing tonight is, in a way, the sort of images which, if somebody had written about memory, um, I might have found th these images. Now, at the Library of Congress in New York is this um, uh, low relief uh, uh, image of, which is just memory, a late 19th century low relief. Now, memory here is holding a helmet. Now, this is another helmet which has much more, you could say that it, it, it's, um, it, it is a memory in the sense that this is Guillaume Apollinaire, the, the poet's helmet. He was uh, wounded in the First World War when he was artillery officer. And it's, um, it's really the, the, the reality of the a piece of shrapnel uh, passing through it. It's typical of a souvenir. Here is Apollinaire recovering. And I mentioned Apollinaire in relation to memory because he said, turn your back on the future. We can know nothing about it, so we can't write about it. But Apollinaire has another fortuitous connection with memory. This is the way memory works inside anyone's head, because he had a great love uh, whom he wrote to from the battlefield. Eventually, he, he married someone else. But her name was Madeleine. And of course, you'll realize what's coming up now. This, here's Madeleine, Madeleine Pages. And here is Proust's uh, Madeleine. That's to say the memory which is evoked by Proust actually taking the um, um, tea and the madeleine which, and bringing back the memory of, of, uh, of an earlier time. <coughs> now, I believe uh, people have spoken about uh, Chris Marker, who in his, he did a CD-ROM entitled Memory, which has like uh, the tentacles of memory go, go everywhere. It's actually, you can follow in a rather chaotic way all kinds of references which M Marker makes to images which have made uh, part of his life. And here it shows the, uh, he's actually got a, a label from the house in, in um, or the place that sells in, in Combray, the, the Madeleines. And quite by chance, and this is the way memory worked, I realized that I'd been at a wedding in Combray. And I can remember nothing about the wedding at all. And it's only which is, oh, perhaps six, seven years ago. And I can remember getting from, from the church mentioned here to the wedding, but that, that, that's about all, because of course you, imagine, you remember the, the food afterwards. Um, to return to Chris Marker, I've no memory of him since I didn't meet him, but I went to meet him, because I was given his address, which is here, uh, and I went to collect a photograph, in fact, for a, the cover to a penguin book. And I was confronted at the front door with a row of bell pushes, but none of them with the name of Marker. Of course, it wasn't his, his real name. So I gave up. But this was the card. And there's the photograph of, uh, the, that uh, Marker took when he was filming in, in China. But in the end, we didn't u use it. And I went off to Magnum and uh, found an, uh, went through the Cartier-Bresson contact strips and, and found something which was relevant to the, to the book. And so that we used this. Incidentally, you can't crop Cartier-Bresson's record, which might have memory, but because the format of the 35 millimeter 
um, film actually is the same as the majority of paperbacks. Now, the art editor of Penguin Books was Germano Facetti, and this is him as he appeared in Chris Marker's La Jeté. And uh, Germano Facetti, he was also the person who actually organized the uh, New Society magazine, which I organized the original layout of it, the magazine which I worked on. And at the same time, he was the art editor of the covers of Penguin Books. Um, now, um, there have been a ma great many graphic representations of memory, and, and one of them is the idea of it as a cinema. And in this, you see the recording camera of, of, on, on the right. This is a 1920s version. And the memory m m moves to being processed in the center to be examined up at the top left. And um, finally, on the left, it, it goes to storage. Now, another uh, friend of uh, Giovanni Facetti's was, in fact, the film director, Anna René. And uh, uh, René used um, uh, memory in several films, Hiroshima, Mon Amour, and uh, uh, this is last year in Marian Bad. And it, they played with uh, both memory and time. And this is a, a graphic record of the relationship uh, and uh, of scenes and, and the dislocation of, of characters and their relationship in the film. And this dreamlike uh, quality, um, which uh, I mean, reverie, if, if you like, is emphasized here by the fact that the the bushes, the conical bushes, bushes have no shadows, but the characters in, in the film to do. So that the dislocation of time and memory is not so odd because the, the images themselves are odd. This is a, a photograph of myself and my mother. I only show it because it was taken possibly exactly where we're all sitting or somewhere near it immediately after the war. But you see, with new technologies, maybe I wasn't with my mother. I can show that I wasn't because here I am alone because I photoshopped my mother out and there's no significant psychological significance <laughs> in that. I wouldn't like you to read anything into it. But um, rather more seriously, of course, history and memory is distorted. The Russians, of course, are well known for the notion of uh, excluding people from, from memory. Uh, in this way, just photoshopping them out of, or I should say, um, airbrushing them out of history, which has become a, a, a common phrase, but obscuring their identity. Now, in the marker's um, um, in memory, he show, one of the things he shows is this picture of the, it's the front cover of a paperback of um, the f film, a film was made from this uh, uh, book, The Lover, The Confession, by Arthur London, who was a, uh, a Czech, um, he was in the Czech government, but was arrested and made like a, a Stalinist trial to, to confess. And the part was played by Yves Montan, who's shown on the right. And this appears to be a photograph of the you know, a still from the film, but in fact, it's a, it's a still which was taken by a photographer there, where uh, Morton's put on dark glasses, just holding his hand up to shelter himself from the eye, so that a photograph isn't, uh, which may appear to be authentic and uh, make memory authentic, isn't necessarily so. And the designer of that paperback cover, a man called Massin, you see he, here he's, this is the cover of one of his books of autobiography. He was also worked in, in publishing. And he, it's called a, 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 journal, a disordered journal. Now, we go back to Chris Marker. The point, I'm a big fan to, to Andre Malraux. Um, the, he is here assembling images of artworks for one of his books, making what he called an imaginary museum. As I said, his um, memoirs were entitled anti-memoirs. He was a mythomaniac and really invented his memory. For example, he described uh, con metaphysical conversations with Stalin, whom he'd never met. 
And of course, he got elephants quite uh, wrong because rather than stay motionless with their memories, if they come across the bones of a dead ele elephant, they, um, they are evidently, apparently, mourning and make a kind of uh, memorial. Another contributor who's been discussed, I, I know, of course, is, uh, I think, perhaps yesterday, or maybe today, was Abby Warburg, because he related images of artworks rather than in the same way, uh, but in a far more sophisticated way, in, in his project called Mnemosyne, um, which was uh, named af uh, after the goddess of memory, the, the mother of the muses. In the top right of the photograph, you can see the panels, which are, in a way, like the pages of a book. Um, I mean, his uh, disciple, his biographer, Gombrich, would have um, uh, used these almost as a reference when he was laying out um, you know, his po popular uh, story of art. And he was interested in, in really the, the continuity of ideas of movement um, over over from classical times onward, um, which can be seen here because there are photographs of uh, women uh, tennis players, for example, contemporary photographs. And of course, the photographs that in Warburg's thing had to be stored, just as any memory has to be stored, and this is the filing cabinets in the Warburg Institute. Now, the idea of, um, uh, of retrieving something, memory, if it hasn't been recorded clearly, uh, losing something on its way to storage or on the way back. Uh, um, this is the, the photo fit of the Yorkshire Ripper on the left and his, what he actually looked like on, on the right, which shows the, the sort of extreme danger of any reliance on memory. Uh, Freud is remembered as somebody who investigated the unconscious and conscious mind and showed how memory exists in both. Um, I think portrait busts in someone's lifetime are a kind of substitute for their real presence and they're only uh, transformed later into a memorial. And uh, Freud's ideas were presented uh, not particularly with his approval in the uh, Pubst film uh, Secrets of, of a Soul, but um, this way of um, uh, the dislocation of memory and the way one mem memory um, depends upon another and triggers another is in this sort of montage is, is, has been very commonly used in, in all kinds of illustration. Uh, this, in fact, is <coughs> Proust's bedroom and in Man Ray's photograph, which is shown in the program of... of of, of this event is probably taken uh, on the blue bed on the right. It rather looks like a consulting room, but it's interesting that there on the wall is a, is a, a memento in the form of a photograph, a way of remembering. Jung also, uh, he claimed that the uh, memories were the most accessible part of, of what would, he called the, the collective unconscious, and as well as a psychotherapist, Jung saw himself as a, as a shaman, a kind of messenger between the human rational world and the world of the, of the, of the spirit and of religion and, and, and myth. And um, Kandinsky, in his early life, was an eth ethnologist. He traveled to Siberia and was particularly interested in, in shamanism. And his visual language seems to belong to that kind of world rather than the everyday human world. And similarly, Boyce, with his account of how he was shot down in, in, in the war and um, uh, really behaved, behaved consciously as a shaman, both as an artist and a, a teacher. And uh, memory, his memory, whether it was false or real, uh, his idea that he was um, tended by Tartars and wrapped in fat and felt, it gave him uh, both a personal myth and the material for much of, of, of his uh, art. Uh, and collective memory, I think, is in the background of, uh, at least to the work of several German artists, for example, Baselitz and Anselm Kiefer. Kiefer's been described as an artist of memory, and his work touches the post-Nazi, post-Holocaust state of acute anxiety. That's a quotation from Marina Warner. 
Um, now, this is the page from a book that I published. There's no question of memory here. There's no monuments or, or, or myth-making. These are family photographs. They're the family of a Polish friend of mine, and all but the woman in the bottom right was murdered in the Holocaust. And at the last moment, the friend couldn't face making the personal memory public, so the page was left out. There's little expression in the West in the memory of Hiroshima as there is of, of uh, other events in Europe, particularly from the Second World War. I think this is uh, strange because uh, the nuclear threat, uh, the uh, anxiety about Iran and so on is, is still with us, but there's very little representation, uh, about a certain amount, I think, in Japanese art of, of its being existent as uh, the point about a photograph, really, is that it, it's always in the past. It, it can trigger memory. The photograph exists in the present, but it is essentially the past. Thank you. <laughs>